I would like to welcome you to today's webinar, The Role of the Mainframe in a Cloud Economy. My name is Arlene Itori, and I'm a webinar coordinator for the Outsourcing Institute, and it is our pleasure to be the co-host of today's event with Axiom. I'll be working in the background to help answer any technical or general questions that you may have. But before we begin, I'd like to quickly tell you about a few tools that you'll be able to use throughout today's session. First, we encourage you at any time during the presentation to submit your questions to today's speakers. To do this, click on the questions box, type your question in the space provided, and click on the submit button. During today's presentation, we'll be asking poll questions to get to know you better and to help ensure that the content is relevant to your specific needs. When the poll appears, be sure to select the answer that best fits each question. Today's webinar is being recorded. You will be receiving a follow-up email in approximately two days, which will include a link with today's recorded webinar and presentation slides. The webinar recording and the presentation slides will also be available at Outsourcing.com. So without further ado, I will now turn it over to our moderator, Joe Hogan, Managing Partner of Joe Hogan Consulting, for the formal introduction of today's speakers. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Arlene. I really appreciate that, and uh, welcome to everyone that's joined us uh, this afternoon. I believe that we have a very uh, solid uh, group of speakers who will, at the end, uh, handle your questions uh, in a panel format. So I really do encourage you, as you go through today, please submit your questions so that this can become truly a, a two-way dialogue. Uh, so I, what I'd like to do is let's get started and introduce you to uh, Jesse uh, Luna. Uh, Jesse is the director of the uh, Global Infrastructure Management Services practice for Axiom. And as a result, Jesse brings 25 years of experience uh, from the IT industry uh, to the discussion today, working directly with customers in this space that are really struggling over how do I make uh, the mainframe work better in a virtual cloud kind of economy. So I think Jesse can add quite a bit uh, to the discussion today. Uh, Jesse, do you want to just say hello so people will know what your voice sounds like? Sure, Joe. Thank you. Hello. Uh, this is Jesse Lennon. Okay. And uh, also joining Jesse from Axiom is Jeff Shoup. And Jeff is the uh, Director of Solution Architecture uh, around uh, the outsourcing. And he's also the mainframe product manager. And again, he is dealing with all of the challenges faced in front of him in today's economy about how to utilize uh, the mainframe in the new world of the cloud architecture. So again, uh, Jeff is a graduate of Elmars College, and he has over 30 years of IT experience coming to the table. So I think that will also add to a lot of the color and information that we need to have today. Jeff, would you like to say hello? Hi, this is Jeff. Looking forward to this uh, presentation today. Okay. And last, but uh, certainly not least, uh, we also have as our guest David Hodgson. And David is the Senior Vice President of Strategy and Product Management for the Mainframe Business Unit of CA Technologies. Or people would recognize them by their other name of, of uh, Computer Associates. Uh, David uh, has recently worked very hard on developing CA's cloud strategy and has brought that to the roots of uh, CA's mainframe business unit and can really share with us both the technology perspective and the information that he's hearing back from the many clients of CA. So I think between the three of these gentlemen here, hopefully we can really, really have a great sharing and a good learning between all of us. But I would ask each of you all to remember, please enter your questions, so that also creates the learning environment of today's session. David, do you want to just say hello real quick so people can understand your voice? Yes, and it's uh, an English accent, although I became an American citizen this year, so. <laughs> well, you congratulations. <laughs> well, welcome to this side of the pond. <laughs> Thank you. Good to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Okay. And so before we turn it over to everybody, uh, we, if we can go to the next slide, just want to give you a brief review of the Outsourcing Institute and its capabilities. 
myself, I've been in, in the uh, outsourcing industry for over 30 years and have learned over the years, especially more recently in the last 15 or so, to use the Outsourcing uh, Institute as a great resource. Uh, they're located at outsourcing.com, very easy to remember, over 70,000 members globally. They're a great resource for case studies. If you're trying to research what are some of the best practices out there, there's some good information that you can get. You can also take advantage of the training uh, from the Outsourcing Institute University. Uh, you can use their RFP builder software and some of the related tools. And also, if you're in this situation where you're either looking to make a change or you want to look at some of the opportunities are there out there or some of the resources you can avail yourself of, through their CMS Incorporated, you can also avail themselves, yourselves of the recruiting services. Uh, they also sponsor local uh, road shows in individual cities, cities near you, such as New York, Houston, Columbus, Ohio, and even as far south as Mexico City. Um, and uh, there's also a new RPO video channel available. So again, please go out to uh, outsourcing.com and see what kind of things can help you as you go through your journey, especially today as it relates to the mainframe and to the cloud. So very, uh, that done very quickly, I would like to now turn this back over to our um, host uh, company uh, for this today's session. And uh, Jesse, uh, please, um, you can go ahead now and walk us through the agenda and get us going. Thanks, Jesse. Excellent. Thanks, Joe. That was a great introduction. Um, so as Joe mentioned, we just uh, our focus is very much around our point of view around the mainframe and the cloud economy. Um, to that end, we'll cover a little bit about Axe and just a brief overview of who we are, what we do in the marketplace, uh, what we believe some of the changes in IT are, are um, forcing a lot of the organizations to face in this new um, sort of challenge time where the cloud is introducing a new platform that is availing you and us of new choices that we have to consider. We believe that there's a new opportunity to relook at your business portfolio and begin to align that more uh, uh, specifically to the platforms that are in play. Um, take a look at the mainframe. I, I, I guess the tagline would be, it's not your uh, father's mainframe anymore. It's a relook at what's on the floor today. And then we'll add some color. Um, our, our guests here from CA will add some perspective on uh, what they've seen, how they've helped customers um, to look at the mainframe as more of a compute engine, an enterprise engine within an organization. And then we'll wrap up and take some of your questions and hopefully have a good and, and, and meaningful exchange with all. And to that end, uh, let me start with a little bit about Axiom. Um, we are a tenured organization with a very strong history in IT outsourcing and marketing services. Been in business for over 45 years have a strong following in both of our disciplines, both in IT outsourcing and marketing services. Um, we maintain data on uh, over 500 million individuals, perform an enormous inordinate amount of uh, updates uh, annually, deliver an incredible amount of uh, emails across 120 countries in more languages than I can imagine here, a thousand marketing databases, and we executed at least the 300,000 multi-channel capabilities campaigns annually. Um, all of that obviously is um, based on the fact that we have some incredible technology to deliver those services and some incredible expertise that we've garnered over those years of delivering that, that function. Um, in our portfolio, we have over 50,000 mainframe MIPS and about 600 terabytes of storage managed, um, about 24,000 open system servers uh, currently under management. 10 petabytes of SAN, as you can imagine, for a lot of organizations, storage being the largest growth factor, that is also true with us. And we, we do a, a good deal of backup for that as well. Over 10,000 databases in pretty much every language style that you can imagine, and over 2.5 trillion records processed per month, which I believe gives us an incredible opportunity to provide expert services to all of our customers. And so let's, let's move on to um, what we see as changes in IT. Um, we've seen, especially as evidenced by some of the conversations we had in recent uh, trade shows in Las Vegas, here in Chicago, as well as just the, the studies that we've been doing research on, that 
least two-thirds of the CIOs that are out there are planning or, or are currently implementing some level of, of investment in the business model to try to gain, capture new markets, or it, it fundamentally go after some additional space in their particular industry. And in turn, that reliance is putting an additional pressure on the CIOs. Actually, had a couple of conversations with some um, Chicago-based CIOs not too long ago, evidence that they are feeling the increased pressure to try to deliver more with less. Nothing new there. But they're also asked to be much more agile, a lot faster, being able to adapt to those changes a lot quicker than I think they previously were held to. And so that pressure is, is forcing them to understand how well their IT processes and their systems are getting better aligned, or more aligned, I should say, to the business goals of the organization, truly bringing the two pieces of the, of the, of the company together. We see the demand for those increases of, of levels of reliability, performance, redundancy, resiliency, just continue to grow um, and, and really forcing every CIO that's out there to relook at their investments, understand where they're making the cho what choices they're making, where they're putting their investments, and what kind of opportunities they're going to pursue. And now we see the cloud and, and, and the focus of the cloud within uh, the market space today being the driver for a lot of organizations to make some decisions around where and how they, can, they put some of their assets out into those, those platforms and who you choose to partner with. Um, as as we, we've seen, there's, there's just a tremendous amount of choice being presented to a lot of organizations, and it really does force you to, to take a step back and examine um, what is the appropriate level of partner that you want to align yourself with, especially as you're looking at the cloud provider space. And so the next page, um, the term of cloud economy really is, is the fact that you have a cloud IT service platform being introduced into the portfolio that is introducing a whole new set of variables, a whole new set of considerations, and it's also promising the opportunity to increase the speed, the agility, and the dynamic nature of how you manage your IT platforms. And so that, that's also created a whole new sector of providers um, that a few years ago probably didn't exist. It's also forced established vendors like ourselves and others to consider an additional platform as part of our service portfolio that we offer to our customers. And obviously, I think we can all say that um, you could argue that mainframe shops have been doing this style of compute for years and years and years so that they could, they could be the, uh, on the forefront of this equation. And so a few of the, the um, suppositions around the cloud economy. Um, at, at least uh, in, in a certain part, we're seeing that the CIO is no longer the only buyer of IT platform services. Traditionally, the intersection point for a managed service provider was to connect with uh, a CIO to develop a relationship, determine how to best align, and do the procurement process. However, the cloud has introduced a new phenomenon, which is now that the business units or divisions with P&L responsibility have the opportunity of going and contracting directly with some of those cloud providers. Seeing sales departments and a lot of organizations, including our own, will go in and partner with Salesforce.com to do the the, the sales transactions. Marketing departments in our, our marketing database will come to organizations like Axiom to procure marketing services. And you'll see and probably have experience with some of your engineering or your test departments that need small levels, transient levels of, of, of images will probably go out and buy some test or dev platforms on the public market and consume those readily. And so this fragmented purchasing authority really creates a lot of challenges for governance. How do you govern the relationships with those providers? How do you ensure that they're part of the consciousness that you need to extend, understand the privacy, confidentiality, and, and just the virtues of your business as you extend your reach out to these other providers? The, um, one of the other challenges, I guess you could, you could pose is, as you, as you look at the enterprise architecture of your organization and you begin to incorporate some of these other providers into that fold, that architecture becomes much more, more fragmented and harder and harder to manage. And so the, the, the challenge for every IT organization that's considering cloud services is how does this factor into my overall vision and strategy where, I want, where I'm looking to take my business. And then finally, and, and obviously not, not, not to minimize, but it's the security challenges that are introduced that really force 
all of us as IT practitioners and professionals to take another look at how we execute these models, how we incorporate these models, who do we trust, who becomes part of our trusted circle as we get, begin to expand our, our, our infrastructure outside of the walls that we control. And so we, we believe that this whole economy is forcing a whole set of new challenges, new opportunities for we as an organization, for you as a company to begin to look at the platforms that you do invest in. And so the, uh, maybe not the ability, but probably rather the imperative I think that's out there is to, to make that determination, that's a, that's a determination on which business assets are going to be shared in the cloud, to truly make an alignment as to where you want to place and extend your infrastructure to. Obviously, we believe that there's a primary benefit of the managed cloud is the fast access to IT resources, gives you that ability to match um, your needs with that dynamic business model and uh, without the additional capital, which has been a hindrance for many organizations. The ability to comply easily if you're in a heavily regulated industry with a much more uh, standardized infrastructure. Um, the ability to truly uh, capture and document that infrastructure uh, it being uh, several of the, of the key points that a private cloud introduces to that organization. So we use the most common definition of a private cloud. Um, the private cloud is a service delivery platform. Obviously, it's becoming much more acceptable. Acceptability obviously also produces more offerings and more choices. Uh, if you take a, an inventory, and depending on where research you look at, um, the, the general consensus, at least recently, has been that there's over 1,500 cloud providers in the market space, and more are being added every day. Um, the vast majority of those that are hanging in their shingle out are either storefronts or some version of a storefront where they'll buy or rent capacity, layer a cloud stack on top of it, and sell um, and, and invariably, what you'll see is very light to almost non-existent uh, either governance models, security models, or um, support models, which truly, uh, in our estimation, are key factors that you have to consider when you're looking at the cloud story. Uh, one of the, the, the eventualities also is that you see ISVs beginning to deliver cloud version of their packages, introducing slowly new license models we believe that are going to be much more attuned to the way um, corporations will consume their resources as you begin to uh, leverage the public cloud, private cloud, the model for software that you'll rent will be in tune with that a lot closer than we have today. It also adds a level of complexity, we believe, to the, to the metrics and compliance models that a lot of the organizations have employed today, and, and we do as well. It's the ability to try to uh, improve and, in, and make more adaptive those key metrics within your organization to match the model that we're being presented. Recently had an opportunity in uh, Las Vegas at a conference where we heard from the first CIO of the United States. Um, his perspective was that cloud was the proper destination for the United States government. In as much as he instituted in his tenure as, as CIO a cloud first uh, mandate for all of his organizations. Um, the idea being that of the 225 or so data centers that the U.S. government runs today, the goal was to shrink that to at least um, no more than 20 and to try to drive everything to cloud providers as much as possible that obviously would align to the, to the, to the spirit of the, of the principles laid out by the CIO, which I thought was extremely, extremely encouraging. Um, we're also seeing the opportunity at least in the market managing, I'm sorry, managed services space, that cloud services are, are infinitely more acceptable than outsourcing. The opportunity to deliver things as a service that can be consumed more effectively is going to be a much more effective business model for we in the managed service space than is currently being delivered. So I'd like to take a break at this point, and um, we'll pose a uh, poll question for you. And the poll question we'd like to offer is, has your organization consumed any private cloud services? The options are, have you built your own? Have you consumed from an external provider? Are you still considering your options? Or are you not considering options at this stage and it's not part of your strategy? I'm going to pause for a second here while we can get some, uh, some uh, input from you all.
it'll be interesting to see how these come back from what we've seen in other events and other people that we've talked with. Yes. Um, Je Jesse, this is Joe. Uh, what I'd like to do is um, ask you maybe a couple of questions as we're waiting for the information to come back. That's okay. Absolutely, yep. Okay. Uh, you know, you mentioned in the terms of the changes in IT, and, and you're obviously out there with uh, a lot of different clients every day. Uh, if you had to ballpark it, where do you see the biggest investments being made in this change? In the software, in the hardware, or in the change management areas? You know what? Um Currently, the, the conversations we're getting into into depth with the um, relationships we're we're exposed to. It, you're seeing, I would say, probably an even split around um, investing in their own infrastructure that is behind their own firewall, um, and then it's also another portion of that that are really looking for a partnered approach, so that mm -hmm. they could they could focus more on the governance model and less mm -hmm. on the infrastructure. And so it's, it's, it's dependent on industry and philosophy, but for the most part, I think you probably see a 30%, 40% on build it myself, and a probably 60 to 70% on, on governance, let's do change management, and let somebody else worry about the delivery. Okay, so let's uh, take a look at the results that we see uh, in terms of our poll here, and the way it looks out. It almost looks like uh, within... Um, you know, build it, build our own, uh, about 30%, and it, it's pretty even all the way through. Consume from an external provider, about 30%, and considering the options, about 30%. So that would uh, seem to come a little bit uh, lower in some respects than what your your estimation is, maybe by about 10%, but not that much. Right. But it looks like mostly everybody in the audience uh, is definitely looking at the topic and where it's going. And, and uh, obviously the question was a little bit um, vague in that if, if you took an inventory of the services you do consume today, right, so you could say um, all the SaaS providers are cloud providers, right, so Salesforce, um, Google Mail, anybody providing it as a service would fall into this categorization, and we do see, including ourselves, right, we are a user of Salesforce.com. We use the HR systems from another provider. We do those things. And we believe as, as, as time progresses and the maturation of this model continues to happen that we'll, we'll probably see more of that consumption continue to grow within the organizations. And that, this is Jeff. I would also add, anybody in that 8%, why don't you uh, just uh, send a little comment in as to what is it that's preventing you from even considering it? I, I'd just be curious and maybe uh, Joe could let us know that later on as we continue through. Yeah, no, I definitely think so. And uh, we, we just got a comment in from some of our listeners. And, Jesse, if you can get a little bit closer to the mic as you're speaking, I think you're breaking up a little bit. Apologies. Uh, I'll, I'll move to as close as I can here. Okay. And uh, those that aren't speaking, if they can go on mute, that will be a little bit better uh, for our audience here. And uh, please, thank you for that comment. And if you have any other questions that you want to send in, uh, please continue to do so. So uh, with that, uh, I believe, uh, Jesse, uh, you're going to hand that off to our next speaker? Uh, I have one last slide here. And, and so we accept um, that opportunity that, you know, the cloud introduces this new platform that you'll have to rationalize to your portfolio. If you accept that opportunity and you look at your portfolio, you sit with your business users, and you kind of align towards a matrix view of this, our perspective is that we believe that as you as you begin to stack up these different portfolios, mainframe, open systems, private cloud, and the public cloud, and you do an alignment, that there will be a, a, a more pragmatic view and applicability of each of those to your business model. Um, we have examples. The reason for some of this is we have an example where several of our customers launched into the cloud plat, private cloud platform and, and uh, did it with the assumption that they were going to save a considerable amount of money, um, they were going to improve performance, and they were going to achieve, I think, their goals faster. They probably got the speed aspect, but the savings didn't materialize, nor did the security and the resilience uh, materialize. And they actually had a retreat, come back and rethink their approach to what they actually put uh, in the cloud. And so, so this uh, metaphor, if you will, is, is, a, is a tool set of how we engage with com in conversations with our customers to truly make that alignment decision and, and articulate the values of each one of these platforms as how to align 
your view to those those platforms. And with that, I'm going to pass it off to Jess, um, who move, moves to the next section here. Okay. Um, thank you, Jesse. Okay. So, just a real quick review. This will take only a moment or two, and then then we'll move on. But today's mainframe obviously is a lot different than what it's been in the prior years, and the most recent generation of today's mainframe has a lot of open systems management tools in it. Of course, the reliability and whatnot has improved. You can run Linux um, on the mainframe, and when we, we all know that when we go to websites, and some of the largest websites in the world are really being backed by mainframes, you really can't even tell the difference. We know that um, the specialty engines that have been put on the, on the box are adapted specifically to run Java and Linux quite well. And so the, it's, it really has become a server, and even though the word mainframe is with it, um, when you're taking a look at it, it's just like, what type of server do you want to run the workload? And yes, the mainframe can be more expensive to get in the footprint in the door, but then depending upon the size and the workload characteristics, the Z196 or the Z114, along with the attached blade enclosures, can certainly provide a very good platform. We know that their IBM has had for a few generations of their mainframes now specialty engines, and that certainly helped with the software costs. And the mainframe has been a dynamic box for moving resources around for some time now. So as we continue, a um, couple other things here, and then I will be done. So large scale mission critical applications are still important. There's lots and lots of applications across all of our um, large companies and small that are still being delivered on ZOS. So this isn't to say that uh, ZOS is going away, but what this large mainframe can do now is talk more seamlessly between Linux, for example, or the blade enclosure and with ZOS legacy applications through memory services and whatnot. So if you are a mainframe customer and also have cloud services or web needs, then this really becomes an attractive option for reducing network costs and other complexities in your environment. So the last thing, and probably most of you have seen these commercials from IBM and, and others where you're collapsing servers and Linux and whatnot onto this. So there's a lot of attractive pieces of the current generation mainframe that really sparked this whole conversation. So I think at this point we are going to one more slide, right? Next slide. Okay. Would you like to uh, do our second poll question at this point? Absolutely. Yep. Okay. Um, we have a question um, from Debbie Gilmore, and uh, what we're looking at is of the 1,500 uh, providers, uh, how can you shortlist the ones offering their own service delivery versus those of rental models? Um, um, good question, Debbie. Actually, um, the research that we're doing and sort of the comparison from a market um, uh, view uh, really takes it at an aggregate level, and so anybody that actually has cloud in their definition gets rated. Um, there are services, obviously, uh, the Foresters and some of the other analysts, and in, in, in I believe actually even Outsourcing Institute has some intelligence here that can help you pare that down um, somewhat. And, and I, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, there's going to be some documentation in that space available soon that's going to be focused around full, I would say, fuller complement service providers that truly deliver not only the infrastructure, but the service along with that. OK, that sounds good. And I believe we've also put up the, uh, the next polling question. And I believe we have some responses uh, coming back. And uh, you know, the question was, are you considering uh, Z Linux in your organization? And uh, overwhelmingly, we have 41% 
of the people listening in today, uh, Jeff, uh, saying they're going in that direction. And uh, we have um, a, a few folks that are saying they don't see the value and a few folks that, uh, you know, uh, don't want to hear about, uh, no client server folks really want to hear about the, 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 the word mainframe. We have 23% there. So what do you think about these results? They're kind of uh, a little bit all over the board. That's, yeah, that's actually interesting, Joe. Uh, in, in for, for CA, we have a steering committee of customers worldwide. There's probably about 100 customers involved, and they're about 50-50 down the middle. 50, about 50% 50 from using Linux on System Z, and about 50% uh, for ver a variety of reasons have not yet adopted it. Uh, so sim similar results, I'd say. Yeah, and th this is actually interesting because this uh, reinforces what I was going to speak to on, the, on my last slide. So. For those that are considering Z-Linux, you obviously already took, took a look at some of the areas where you can save. For those of you in the 14% that are uh, saying it's too expensive, or similarly, those in the next bucket where you don't see the value, um, I guess it depends upon you know how you know a lar how large of a shop you are. If, if you're in a smaller shop, you might not be able to justify the footprint. But for those of you that are paying middleware costs by the core, or by the socket, uh, you certainly sh should be able to reduce your cost there when you transition that workflow to IFL engines. And there are certainly other labor savings that can be applied too. So I think there's a, uh, a critical mass that can make this actually a cost save, and that's if you ignore the other goodnesses that you come to, you, to know and expect from uh, mainframe. And then the final point about um, client server folks don't want to hear the word mainframe. Really, at this point in time, I think uh, IBM's direction is that this is just another server. And when you take a look at the blade attachment, and uh, you can buy mainframes nowadays that don't have anything to do with the legacy applications. It's purely just a very fast, uh, multifaceted server. So, okay, on to the next slide. Uh, next, there you go. Okay, so the last thing to think about before I turn this over to David is when you're taking a look at whether you want to put Linux on servers or whether you want to put them on the mainframe, um, A, obviously if you're already running legacy applications, that's a huge leg up for this because you've already got the gear in there or potentially have the gear in there. And then you're already, because of the fact that the gear is already there, then you're able to leverage that in investment. And then on top of it, um, I think about a year, year and a half ago, IBM had about 1,300 applications certified for uh, Z Linux, and the number is well over 3,000 now, where the application providers have certified that their applications will work on Z Linux as well, so support is not an issue. Although, obviously, depending upon what workload you're running, you would have to check with that particular vendor to see if they have a Z Linux uh, support or not. So, um, at the end of the day, we think it's a, a good, viable option, and it fits very well into this whole cloud topic. So, now at this point, I'm ready to turn this over to uh, David. Yeah, so uh, Jeff's done a good job of just introducing the, uh, the the enterprise, and I think that uh, clearly, if you have a mainframe today, uh, it's just it's just true that the mainframe is uh, integral to your current IT strategy. And in fact, even some of the smaller shops we talk to, who uh, actually have multi-year plans to get off the mainframe, still we find those 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 customers are still thinking that the mainframe is integral to their IT strategy incredibly important part of their business critical services, and they're still continuing to invest in it. So if you have a mainframe, it just is integral to your IT strategy. And as you adopt uh, a private cloud strategy or a cloud strategy overall, it's, it's, you won't get very far before you see the mainframe playing a role. So you know, most people who start off thinking about private cloud probably start off thinking that it's something they're going to do with VMware, perhaps, on their open system server. Uh, but very quickly, if you get past the immediate, easy, low-hanging fruit or, 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 or new application workflows, when you get to your serious uh, business-critical 
applications, the data is on the mainframe, the transaction processing is on the mainframe. And you really need a cloud strategy that's going to integrate the two. Next slide. So those of us who are, are, are mainframe uh, bigots uh, historically, uh, you know, we tend to look at this cloud revolution and say, well, you know, isn't isn't the mainframe being, hasn't it been doing the cloud for all these years? You look at the NIST definition of, of what cloud computing is and it talks about scalability and elasticity and dynamic provisioning and all these things. And you sort of think, well, hang on a minute, that's what the mainframe's been doing for 40 years, isn't it? Well, you know, I mean, that goes so far. I mean, all, all ideas in computing are built on, on historic ideas and everything's an evolution on the past. So, yes, we've learned a lot as we've swung from centralized computing to distributed computing. And now, in a sense, cloud computing is sort of a return to centralized computing, or you don't care where the compute or the data is. In, in that sense, it's centralized computing. Uh, yes, you inherit a lot of the same values. But, but in truth be, truth be told, the mainframe is not going to be uh, uh, as much as IBM might like it with the enterprise. The, the, no one is going to have a cloud strategy that is just the mainframe. I, and what I think is that the mainframe could be a valuable part of a cloud strategy. Uh, and as I said, as you, as you approach what, whatever your private cloud or hybrid cloud strategy is, you are not going to be rip and replace. You are going to be building on the infrastructure that's there already. Maybe there's some new options to host or re-host some, uh, some of the infrastructure. But you're not going to be starting again. So if you've got a mainframe and it's an integral part of your, your, your business, it, you're, you're going to include it. But neither is the idea of, of uh, you, you scrapping all that VMware stuff and moving all the workflow back to the mainframe. That's not going to happen either. It is going to be, you're going to have a private cloud strategy that is heterogeneous. Interestingly, that little uh, graph down the, uh, the left-hand side, you might not see it too clearly, but CA did uh, earlier this year, we did our own survey of 500 customers worldwide. And, and uh, just to ask, you know, did you see the mainframe as, as important as part of a cloud strategy? And 80% said they did. Now, I would love it was an anonymous survey. I would love to talk to these people. I can bet you that those 80%, although they feel it's important to their cloud strategy, it's for all the reasons I just said, because they know the mainframe is important to their business. Probably most of those 80% have no idea yet how they're really going to use the mainframe as part of their cloud strategy. And that's certainly something that you're going to have to... Uh, to think about as, as you tackle these issues. Next slide. The way we see it at CA, I, and uh, I'm not really here to talk about our cloud strategy, would love to follow up with anyone who is interested, but we use that little graphic down the bottom there to, to base our strategy on it. And it sort of says, you know, that if you've got a mainframe, then you've got ZOS uh, and, and workloads, data, transaction processing running on there. You've got the opportunity at least to run Linux on System Z, and about 50% of our customers probably are. And then you've got the Z, new Z Enterprise as a new greenfield, and of course you've got a lot of distributed environment. The, the, your private cloud strategy should embrace all those environments and reach back into ZOS uh, in, in one sense or another, because that's where the data and the transaction processing is. You also are going to have to embrace public cloud in some way, or at least an external provider, I believe. Frankly, as Jesse said earlier, you know, one of the things about cloud is it's changed the buying patterns of IT. We see increasingly business going around IT and just buying services out, outside you know, without permission. In fact, we even found cases of people inside IT in QA going outside of IT policy and just buying a server for Amazon to, do, to get some extra QA equipment or something. So it's just it's out there. Now, you know, in one sense, this is bad news for IT organizations. In another, side, in another sense, it's really good news, because I think that what this represents is, is a, a shake-up of the IT values and a real chance for IT to actually provide a competitive advantage to the business again. If you do this right, if you, if you understand what you can do with cloud as an IT organization, this is a chance to, become, to, to, to end the days of just being a cost center and a burden to the bottom line and really become a means of competitive advantage. So it's a real opportunity. Uh, you are going to uh, uh, you are going to need to to find some way, I think, of leveraging uh, uh, a hybrid cloud strategy. That is not just using your uh, your own infrastructure, 
but being able to cloud burst to a service provider or, or, or something, uh, some other uh, provider of uh, resources, so that you can actually cloud burst or scale your applications and the, and the, uh, the compute power you have inside, and, and that's really a, a you know a key part of, of of leveraging the value of a cloud computing strategy. The, the other the other little logo up there at the top right is you know we think particularly as you go to cloud computing you're going to have to master these these disciplines. How do you model the applications and the workloads, particularly around dynamic workload needs? How do you assemble the services? A big piece of cloud is being being agile and flexible, and being able to assemble a service and the next year being able to reconfigure it and assemble it again. Maybe change the way you the way something's executing. Maybe change the very application or a piece of the, of the service that, that you're using. Automating, assuring, and securing. And from, from the CA strategy, uh, you know we have solutions to uh, in all those areas. I'll just mention two, and I won't do a big advert here, but you you might want to find out more about them. One is our new our recent ITKO acquisition, which allows you to to model and test. Uh, any applications, but it's particularly relevant in a cloud environment where you might have to be able to uh, change where things are running or change the workloads. And AppLogic, which is a, a cloud computing environment, which is a distributed product at the moment. A lot of service providers use it. It's very useful to uh, to actually implement cloud applications from and hybrid cloud implementations on distributed environments. We're porting that to the mainframe. It's the keystone of our integrated uh, cloud strategy and allow you to use your mainframe and your distributed environments in a seamless cloud platform. Next slide. So Jeff mentioned uh, the Z Enterprise and some of the changes that brings, and of course uh, it's, going to, it's going to bring ZBX to us, but we've already got Z Linux. And as you said, about 50% of people and about 50% of you are, are using Z Linux. So I just thought uh, I'd give an example here, which is sort of you know, a lot of, most people who are using Linux on System Z don't call it cloud. But in fact, uh, a, a lot of the things that people are doing are sort of proto-cloud. And this example I've got is, is, is very like a cloud implementation in some ways, although I suspect they didn't call it cloud at the time. This is a, one of our government agencies, I won't name them, but they're a very, very important agency. Uh, you know, our security depends on these people probably. Uh, and they, they've been using our database, actually, but, but the example would work for DB2 or any large database uh, for years now, and, and massive implementation of data on this Datacom database. And, of course, a traditional green screen application. They've probably been using it for 20 years, I'm, I'm sure, or more. And that they, needed to, uh, they needed to modernize this application. So people probably are either using Linux to modernize applications or to, or to just use it as a more cost-effective platform. Those are probably the two high-level reasons. In this case, they were trying to modernize it. They needed to update what, the, what they were doing, the way they did things. They needed to connect cameras and, and uh, document readers and scanners and that sort of thing, and actually have a much more distributed and much more rapid access to the information in the database so that they could uh, verify what was going on and, and, and use the application. So they wanted to all the benefits of the sort of open system software, the the uh, the, the the new software, the the, uh, the web applications, and all the things that they could do with data. But they, but they uh, were tied to this mainframe database, and they also didn't have, as you can see down the bottom there, they also didn't have the capacity to to build a whole new uh, uh, data center and and just move the whole thing off the mainframe. They they couldn't uh, they couldn't increase power or, or anything like that. Next slide. So what they did do was they decided to go. You know, IBM helped them here. They uh, they added a lot of uh, IFL engines to increase the, the capacity, and they did this. There was, I mean, they just used the existing existing data center, the existing mainframes that they had. Uh, they already had some free IFLs from IBM. They just added a lot more. They uh, they deployed, uh, you know, just a, a, a modern Java-based web-based application and connected it back to ZOS. And of course, as people who use it know, one of the huge advantages and probably one of the best uh, reasons for using Linux on System Z is when you're trying to make that connection back to ZOS, where the data is, is very fast, hypersocket hypersocket connection, which is uh, almost like an in-memory network. So you've got fast and very, very secure access to your data. 
Uh, and that's probably one of the reasons for, for moving uh, distributed applications that are accessing data, moving them from truly distributed servers to Linux on System Z, uh, so that you get that uh, better performance and more secure. Next slide. So the, re the result was a, was a huge success. And you can see that the, the various components here, I won't go through them all, but just, just to sort of point to the scale of the thing here. They ended up with 32 IFLs with 140, it's probably bigger than this, these slides are a little old now, but it's probably grown, 140 virtualized Linux servers. So j just think about that, that's very like a cloud scale application. And the demand of this application to, the, to what they're using the data for to control uh, security aspects of uh, in, in, in multiple locations around the country, uh, around the borders and things. Uh, the, the, the demand is, is, is very unknown. So it's peaks and troughs unpredictably. Again, very like a, a, what we think of as a cloud uh, application. So they don't call it cloud. It's a Linux on System Z application. But all of the, all of the values of Linux on System Z uh, uh, allow them to meet the same sort of demands as, as we would describe of a, of a cloud application now. Uh, that's the example. I think I'm... Passing back to you, Jesse. Um, okay. Yeah, was actually, um, thank you, David. It's a very, very good example of what we've illustrated here. Um, some key takeaways, and then we'll jump into the questions and, and answers. Um, obviously, thank you again for your your attention. Um, from from the perspective of Axiom and our partners here with with CA and in support of OI, uh, you know, very much appreciative of your time. Um, we believe some of the takeaways that we'd leave you with is obviously the leverage that you have, the key messages. Look at your mainframe with a new set of eyes. Um, if you can't adopt by the right platforms that align to your corporate strategy, obviously it's the opportunity to leverage a partnership. Um, cloud, maybe not yet applicable to all your workloads, but it's coming up fast and it's, and it's worth reconsidering uh, an alignment process to make sure you make the wisest choice possible. And also not to ignore the fact that you have to ensure that the recoverability of those systems can be achieved on whatever platform you choose, and that that's the level of resiliency demanded by your application that seems to be one of the factors that gets ignored when um, some folks move to the cloud. Um, and in, in general, just thank you for your time and attention, and we wish everybody a very happy holiday season and a prosperous new year. And Joe, I think we'll turn it back to you if we can take questions at this stage. No, that would be great. I think uh, you all uh, have done a very incredible job Thank you. Of, uh, of, of sharing the information. Uh, one of the questions I think I would like to um, share with you all and see if uh, you can get your comments on it very quickly. One of the things that happens in this environment is you, you have the complexity uh, of the integration of the hardware, which you guys have done a really good job at describing. But you also have the complexity of how do I make um, Salesforce.com? How do I make uh, my payroll system say with ADP? Uh, how do I make all of these business units that are going for these process applications in the cloud and tie all of that back? How do I get that done? Uh, have you guys given that some thought? How do I make the integration happen? I guess is the way. Um, I, you know, David will take a crack at this as well. I would say integration probably not the the word that I would choose, Joe. I okay. would say if you're looking at Salesforce, you're looking at those providers, and as more organizations are exploring SaaS as the delivery model, um, I think the opportunity for you to look at it is, is, is how does it align to your governance model? Do the principles behind those providers align? in theory to what you're trying to accomplish. Um, you know, it's, it's not unusual for you to go and ring up a, a Salesforce. You can ask them, how are you delivering? What's the security principles? And does it match to what I'm trying to accomplish? Are you comfortable in that respect? And having those kind of frank conversations with each one of those as a service providers as a means of trying to get that, that consistency of view and making sure that it aligns. At least, at least that would be the perspective from an Axiom um, take on, on that kind of a sure. situation. Yeah, I mean, what, what I like about the cloud revolution, and what yeah. I like about the, the having to use, uh, having to sort of combine mainframe and distributed again in a, in a private cloud implementation, 
is that what we're seeing is, is a move away from the polarizations around platforms that have been sort of mainframe versus distributed. We've had that those two camps for, for 20 years. And, and people are really beginning to think, how can, I, how can I best align IT to my business needs? Cloud computing is all about the application uh, and the business service. And you just don't mind anymore where it runs. I mean, obviously, there are some physical limitations. Mm -hmm. It's all about fit for purpose, fit for task. Uh, and, and how do I best align things to the business? So I, I think it starts off by a clear, uh, uh, a clear use case, a, a, a clear uh, understanding of your business needs and what you want out of it. And, and if you're talking about SAP, you know, what, what are you going to run it against? Uh, and where are you going to run it? At CA, we frankly run SAP and DB2 uh, on the mainframe. Now that mm -hmm. may be right for us. Uh, it, it, you might want to run it in the distributed environment. It might be best to buy that as a, as a, as a cloud service and, and not run it at all yourself. It really starts off uh, just being, being very clear on what the business goals are and how you best meet those from a sort of cost, a security, a serviceability, you know, and, and, and what other integration needs you've got. And, and what, what data requirements you have and where you can tolerate your data being at, too. Absolutely. Okay. So you know, there's, there's, it's not an easy answer, but I think it's uh, you know it's a structured answer, and it starts off with with the business needs, and not being released really from the idea that a you have to run it in house, and b you have to run it out on house on a distributed environment, uh, and and you have more options, you have more options, and there'll be more cost effective options than the ones you're tying yourself to today. Okay. Yeah, so, so one other question, you know, coming back to you guys as you're talking about this. It, it, it seems to me, you know, when you talk about the 1,500 or so uh, vendors that are out there doing something in the cloud, and I'm sure, you know, you all at CA and, and as a service provider, XCOM, see it, you know, quite often, is how, how do you bring simplicity to it? How do you know who the guys are to deal with? Well, I mean, from, from an accent perspective, you could say, and, and, and I apologize if it's a little self-serving, but it's the tenure of the organization. It's the service history. It's, it's the business that we're in. Um, the shop didn't crop up over the last year. It, it has been in the business of delivering service and partnering with our customers for over 45 years. It's that match, maturity level that I think um, if you're looking at how do I align myself with an organization that truly meets my needs and can partner? My estimation of the factors you look for is how long have they been in business, what's the service and delivery model, and can I engage with them directly, or is it all transaction-based on the web? It really depends on your usage and how you plan to go about that. Our perspective would be engage with somebody you can shake hands with that has the centers of excellence that can help you along the path to make the decisions you're trying to make. Yeah, because once you use a cloud provider and you give them your data, if they're out of business next week or next month, um, that, that's a huge concern for most, most people, I would think. Well, one of the things I recommend is, uh, is, is CA with a number of other vendors. CA actually is providing the funding, but it's, it's a multi-vendor uh, service, offers uh, cloudcommons.com. And if you're not familiar with that site, I'd, I'd, I'd uh, go to cloudcommons.com. You can just visit it or you can register. A lot of really useful information there about just general cloud issues, and, and but also vendor vendor rating. A lot of opportunities to discuss just this sort of thing with uh, with other people who might have experience. So, you know, the thing about the cloud is community and discussion, crowdsourcing ideas and solutions. So get on cloudcommons.com and uh, get some answers. No, that's great. Yeah, there's also another book out there too called Cloud Sourcing the Corporation, where they Try to try to pick out who the top 100 are. Right. So that's also another interesting resource. So there's a lot out there. Uh, just to add to that, we have another question I want to um, um, share with you all and see how you guys want to handle this. Is where can I review the list of certified Z uh, VM applications? It comes in from uh, Brian Kipling. Uh, can you guys give us uh, give give Brian some uh, answers on that? The uh, IBM.com website, it's, yeah, i got to go several layers deep, and um, afterwards, if you send me an email, you've got my email on the screen, I can uh, send you a link to it. But on the IBM.com website, they have 
a, a listing of all the ISVs that are certified to run under Z Linux. Yeah, and, 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 Brian, and just so Brian knows, that's Jeffrey that's speaking. So, Correct. Uh, so he knows which one to send the email to. There's about uh, there's about there's over three thousand applications that uh, that you can run on on Linux on System Z, and all of the all of the regular stuff that you you hear about on the distributed, a lot of the open source stuff, Apache, JBoss, uh, LifeRay, you know, all all of the regular sort of open system stuff, it, it is all compatible and configurable to run on uh, Linux on System. Okay, Fan fantastic. So, one other question as we begin to to wrap this up, um, as we're getting closer to it's, uh, the last five minutes, would be okay if you guys were um, starting out today, and uh, really beginning to uh, build your strategy around this. Uh, what would be the three pieces, the three things that uh, you should always keep as fundamental as you begin on your cloud journey? Um, so the, I, the three metrics I believe that are going to be key for you is obviously going to be um, your application or your business inventory, right? It, it's having a frank conversation as an IT professional with your business leaders to take an inventory and take stock and to determine characteristics that are valuable to the business, step one. An inventory of your platforms that you have available to you, whether it's just mainframe, open systems, and the kind of choices that are available for you to make. And, you know, obviously in a very directed way, the, the, the partners are the key vendors and, and, and uh, managed service providers that might be options for you to consider as you're looking at that. So the three components are, if I look at how I developed the strategy for this, and I'm starting out today, inventory of what I have, inventory of where I can put it, and the extension of my organization, that I, who I can partner with, to get me to the destination that I'm going to to develop with my business leaders. Okay, okay, great answer. And then I think one other question, which has also come in from Sharon, uh, is how you know? I mean, we, we talk large scale, and this always bothers me when people talk about the cloud. They talk about big corporations, the government's doing it, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But how do you take this kind of cloud computing and make it applicable to small scale industries? you know, to those medium-sized and small-sized companies? How can they take advantage of the kind of technology that you're talking about? Honestly, I, you know, I, I don't want to uh, just plug a CA product. And, and, uh, but I would, if you're a small business, I would, look at, I would look at AppLogic. It's a great product available today on distributed environments. It will be available in the future on the mainframe. But a lot of the very small service providers use it. Just because it is a plug, it's easy to set up. It's a, it, it scales to big to big uh, implementations, but it's a, an easy way and a much more affordable way than than VMware. It's it's a cheaper software and requires it will use commodity uh, hardware. So uh, AppLogic is probably your honestly is probably your cheapest and easiest way of getting started today. Uh, of course, most people have got huge investments in VMware, sure. uh, and so that's, that's, that's a different question. If you just want to get started and you're small and, and you've got the choice, just, just try, at least look at that logic. Um, one last comment on that I would say, and obviously we didn't want to paint the picture that all of those storefront providers are, are, are not appropriate. They have their, their usage, and you know, I think one of the key discussion points would be engage with some of them determine what kind of strategy, what, what are they delivering for you, what kind of service model is it, and if they're truly applicable to the business model that you're in, if you're small to medium-sized business and you can consume in that fashion and you consciously understand the in and the out of that, then they can be a very viable, very economical provider that will help you get to your path. And then how much do you want to do yourself? And there's different uh, security and use, and there's a lot of parameters that will vary from storefront or from provider to provider, depending upon the sensitivity of your data and what uh, options you have too. So that's partly, like Jesse said earlier, you got to figure out what your particular needs are. Okay, very good, gentlemen. I want to thank you all very, very much uh, for your efforts today as we come to the top of the hour. We have a couple of more questions in the queue. And we will respond back to those by email very, very quickly. But uh, on behalf of the Outsourcing Institute, uh, on behalf of our uh, sponsoring partner today, uh, Axiom, uh, 
and Jesse, Jeff, David, myself. We want to thank you all and uh, wish you all the best of the uh, upcoming holiday season and uh, all the best of the coming year uh, for your businesses. Thank you again. We'll talk to you soon.